Radio Free Santa Clarita presents The Talk of Santa Clarita A podcast about issues involving Santa Clarita and the surrounding valley Episode 121 Author of The Wrong Side of the Table, Acer Salmon And now, let's see what The Talk of Santa Clarita is And remember, this is for posterity, so be honest. Okay. Uh, First of all, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Of course. This is exciting. Uh, Full disclosure to everybody, uh, we're old friends. From a million years ago. From a million years ago. Um, uh, how long have we known each other? Since uh, 1989, I think. Well, I yes. Uh, I think earlier than that, I remember you when you had long hair. Did No, you had. I knew you when you had kind of chin-length hair. Mm-hmm. You were doing the uh, late 80s. M- mullet. <laughs> no, it wasn't a mullet. It was like the late 80s sort of, yeah. you know, alter, alternative band thing yeah. um, with your jacket. I remember your leather jacket. You yeah. called yourself Sappy. Well, let's not bring that one let's up. Not, we're bringing it up, man. <laughs> we're going deep. Um, and then what What I love about our story is that, uh, maybe it's not interesting to anybody but me, but yeah. we both were at the University of Kentucky. We both worked at the radio station. Mm-hmm. And WFL. Then, right. And then we lost touch for some reason. Mm-hmm. And then how did I find out? Maybe I knew that you were coming to California. We knew. We, I remember uh, I found out that you had applied to film school the same year I had, and we both got accepted. You got accepted to Loyola Marymount. But you got uh, in a year before, didn't you? No, same year, Cal Arts. Really? Yeah, we were, I feel I'm like, a pr- maybe. I feel like you were here earlier because you showed me Barney's Beanery. You took me around. Remember Lisa and I? You took us. Oh, to, I don't. I honestly, I don't know. Yeah, so. but at that point, you were in the Birkenstocks and the long hair down uh, to like down to there. To, yeah. down well, here. I was. I was so into my '90s grunge thing. Yeah. So, well, so and yeah, so I remember. I'm like, oh my god, you're my like. That's the coolest thing. To know somebody from Kentucky to that moved, you know, over here. So and now here we are. And now here we are <laughs> in various incarnations. And then the other thing that I remember about when we were both in film school is all like our two-hour conversations on the phone. We would talk a long time. Remember, like yeah. about movies, and you were always predicting the best picture of Oscar winner. Yeah, always accurately. Uh, I, I, I predict I, I, this I, is going to win, and I'm like, oh, okay, fine. But then it would win. I'm, I'll make a prediction right now. Black, what? Black Panther wins best picture. I, I think that'll happen. I, so. yeah, I, that, which is crazy to me, but uh, I, I, love, I love the movie. But I just uh, do you, it, you crazy just in the context of a superhero movie winning best w- picture. Right. It just seems insane. But it's more than just a superhero <laughs> sure, picture, and sure. with the you know the climate and all of that. I think it's. Okay, we're, we're we're digressing to film stuff. So uh, well, no, we're digressing to the culture of this society's of, culture. Okay. Um, uh, well, we, we've got you here not not because you're from Santa Clarita, but because you're an old friend of mine, and right. you've got this new book out called uh, I'll "Hold It Up" and the, "The Wrong End of the Table" by Acer Salmon, uh, like that. You have um, to do the whole thing, like that. The whole Hold title: it. "The, the wrong, wrong End of the Table: A Mostly Comic Memoir of a Muslim Arab." American Woman Just Trying to Fit In by Acer Salmon Ford by Reza Eslan. That's right. Yeah, nice. Um, you know, you are my first book author. Really? To, to, to actually do the show. I've done politicians. I've done everything else uh, I can think of, but I don't think I've done a... I'm honored. A, an honor. Uh, an I author. So, I, uh... so well, let's let's just get it, uh, get straight into it. Uh, tell us what The Wrong End of the Table, a mostly comic memoir of a Muslim Amer- American woman trying just trying to fit in is about. Just, <laughs> in, the, in the 25 words or less, can you tell us what it's about? Well, I mean, I don't know how many words that title was, but that, <laughs> that's some of them. But basically... It is for anyone who's ever felt like the other, who's mm-hmm. never felt like they fit in. Mm-hmm. I am I'm from Iraq. I was mm-hmm. born in Iraq. I grew up in Kentucky, mm-hmm. which, you know, as you can imagine, this was this was in the 70s before Iraq was a household name. Nobody right. really knew, you know, so it wasn't really mm-hmm. there wasn't a lot of awareness. And I my my I just wanted to fit in basically. Mm-hmm. In Kentucky, with all of the you know counterparts, which at the time were blonde, mm-hmm. you know, blue-haired, and you know, I'm not saying I'm proud of it, but that's the the model that was held up to me. So um, it's just basically me trying to navigate yeah. that that life and finding that you know even when I left there, mm-hmm. I was still constantly trying to fit in. There was this you know it's this inherent thing mm-hmm. that I thought was specific to me. 
Yeah. I thought it was specific to me as an immigrant or as, as an Arab, as a Muslim. Or... Yeah. Well, and also, so yeah, specific. So I, yes, I'm, I'm from Iraq. I'm Muslim. My parents are very, uh, they're secular. I mean, mm-hmm. I shouldn't say secular. They're spiritual. Mm-hmm. They're not in the, and, and what I mean by that is that we're not, you know, they, a lot of my friends who are Arabs, Muslim Arabs, their parents made them read the Quran, you know, yeah. do that. My parents were very much just, you know, more relaxed about it, which allowed me to embrace mm-hmm. what I wanted from it. Mm-hmm. which was great and to their to their credit and um uh lost my train of thought which oh, we were just do. talking about uh you know the the, the idea of being of not feeling like you right. because you're right. a, a, a iraqi and a, an immigrant and things right and i think the thing for me which i i i you know it, it, it took me a while to figure out is that a lot of you know my parents came here mm-hmm. they were they were trying to fit in as well mm-hmm. so when you're a kid and you're trying to fit in with a normal thing like, oh, so-and-so called, made a, made fun of my name, which all kids do, right? Mm-hmm. Acer, Eraser, or whatever, or, you know, I don't know if st- called you Steve, what, like made some sort of play on no, your name. No, people just call me Sappy, which is just Right, bad, okay. So. <laughs> so, so, the kids, because kids are mean and, yeah. you know, whatever. But when you have, I feel like because my family was trying to fit in, mm-hmm. I didn't get that, you know, the the way to assimilate and mm-hmm. so we we all we kind of became a little, little pod mm-hmm. and that i feel like that made me feel more like an outsider do you you're saying that because your your parents were trying to assimilate themselves it, right. you didn't have that you know that cushion to it, fall onto to kind of for them to say it's okay not to fit in you know or, yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah. and then they would always just say oh we we'll just leave it or whatever yeah. blah 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 but there was always this undercurrent yeah. and um you know it could be it could be a personality thing as well because yeah. I think I went through this whole idea where I attached being my identity from mm-hmm. my heritage. Yeah. And the more you know, when I I think when I was nineteen, I had my first boyfriend, and you know he would and he was a white guy in Kentucky, and mm-hmm. he would say, you know, you're not that special. You're not. Everybody feels like an outsider. Yeah. And I didn't believe him. I was like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. But as I'm, you know, as really when I started writing this book yeah. is when I started talking to people and I found that it really clicked in for me. Yeah. Um, what and, do you mean by clicking in? Well, okay. So jumping a little bit further ahead is, is that I always thought I felt like an outsider, but I think when I became, you know, in, in the last five, five, or, you know, maybe 10 years, I realized, okay, yeah, you're not the only one. Get mm-hmm. over it. Right. Yeah. Get over it. And you just, that's how, you know, something that you feel, whatever. And, um, and, and I started then when this opportunity came to, to, when I started writing this book and I found my first question to myself was, well, why is this going to be interesting to somebody else? Mm -hmm. And, you know, to the point where I'm thinking, I don't, I didn't have anything horrible happen to me. You know, all the memoirs that are these Muslim at the time, Mm -hmm. Muslim, Arab women, whatever, something horrible had happened. They had either tried, you know, gotten shot or Mm -hmm. trying to go to school or, you know, Mm -hmm. some sort of horrific abuse. And I didn't, luckily I didn't have that. But at the same time I thought, who's going to care? Right. Right. So what I decided to do, and I mean, I'm a comedy writer anyway, but what I decided Mm -hmm. to do is make it funny. Yeah. And, um, I think the first, incarnation of the first draft you know mm-hmm. when you, you send so the way books have you know you don't write the whole book you do the the um you do a, a like an outline or a, a, breakdown a, a, or proposal, a, a proposal a book a man yeah, yeah. A proposal and when i sent it out the first version of it and mm-hmm. it, you know it, it the notes came back which were great that i got these notes that you know it's a little sticky i'm getting in my own way and yeah. i thought okay you know what i've been doing this all my life mm-hmm. i've been hiding behind comedy mm-hmm. And that is not doing me any favors, and it's not doing me any favors connecting with people. Right. And so I just decided I'm just going to tell my story. Mm-hmm. It's going to be as small as it is, but it's even though it's big yeah. to me, because everybody has their, you know, experiences mm-hmm. that that are big to them. And right. I feel like, especially now, right now mm-hmm. in this you know time climate, authenticity is such a huge thing. That's why. You know the whole thing with uh, Black uh, Black Panther. It's mm-hmm. it's not so much a superhero movie. It's about you know your identity and all of that, sure. and I um, it blew my mind how when I started to talk to people on that not even people I knew. I mean I mm-hmm. knew my friends would like it or whatever, but people that I didn't expect to connect with it. A lot of a lot of people that have responded to this are um, white men in their. I don't know, 60s or something like that, that have, you know, you know yeah. and it's been in, which is cool because, yeah. you know, they're like, oh, I will, I, maybe it's more of an, I've learned about, mm-hmm. yeah, this is educational. But anyway, without digressing too much, I, um, 
just I found that if you know I was true to myself, somebody was going to find something that mm-hmm. they found insightful. Yeah, and I loved that, and that helped me keep going, and it helped me actually. In a way, as I was writing it, it was this was 2016. This was in the beginning of the whole, you know, Trump is running, but yeah. he's oh, he's not going to win. But as I, you know, the, just the climate helped mm. me write that because I was I was reacting to what was going on um, in the world and mm-hmm. how I felt. Right. So it. it um, well, I, I, I want to talk about that a little bit, but uh, about being a Muslim in America, particularly in Trump's America. But, mm-hmm. but um, I will say this: you know, having known you as long as I have, um, I was really intrigued by the book because uh, the thing that uh, stuck out to me was the insecurities that you seem to have, and and the and the, <laughs> which I have never detected in you, really. I mean, I, for the most part, I mean, it it it, it uh, the and even. When we first met in Kentucky, I, I never really put too much thought into the fact that you were Muslim or Iraqi or anything like that. I just thought you had this cool name, Acer. You know, I just uh, so to me, was this a bit of a confessional for yourself? I mean, just getting into, uh, I mean, was it cathartic writing it? Yeah, it was the most. This was the most amazing experience I've had in mm-hmm. my life thus far, creatively. Yeah, because uh, it was cathartic for two for two reasons um because i'm yeah it was basically a confessional as you say mm. in, in a way but also i you know i've i've been writing you know scripts i've been writing pilots mm-hmm. i've been trying to steer my career in that direction right working on steering my career in that direction and but you're writing as another character you mm-hmm. know it's always sammy or summer or whatever mm-hmm. so you can hide you can put truths, but they're not, it's not like you're writing about yourself. Right. And this was me writing about me. Mm-hmm. And um, and it was easier to write about the youth stuff mm-hmm. because that was in the past. Right. But then we got into, um, it's interesting because, so, you know, it goes, it's linear and it starts mm-hmm. from my arriving, we arri- us arriving in the States in Ohio and how some weird stuff happened there mm-hmm. um, that formed my feeling like an outsider and specific to me, not really, you know, specific to all immigrants, but maybe some somebody might re- relate. But... Um, when I got, when you met me, when I got to college, I think at that point I had been so uh, trained and skilled in the art of blending in mm-hmm. that suddenly I met here at, at um, WRFL, which is like this, you know, group of misfits. I was going to say, yeah, it, it, if you felt like a misfit, any, anyway, you were yeah. at the at the place right. where the misfits were, right? You know, so it was like the place to go, you know. Right. But for me, yeah. I suddenly felt like I was too normal. Yeah. I remember they were, you know, because my... I remember my t- thinking that about you, too. Yeah. I mean, I had spent so much time honing the perfect page boy haircut and, you know, the, I mean, acid wash, whatever was in style. But I was so preppy. I had, yeah. I remember I had plaid sneakers and I had a um, blue blazer that I was really proud about, made me yeah. look like um, David Letterman. I mean, that was like, that was my thing. I just wanted to fit in. Yeah. And I come here and there, and, you know, mohawks and tattoos and piercings of all well no i were there were piercings big then i don't know yeah, some there people, were some yeah Diane okay pipes had them. and just like you know people that were changing their names and this and that and, da, da, da. and i was like oh my god and you know i felt comfortable fitting in yeah. but at the same time i felt really inadequate yeah. and, and that's a product of my built-in neuroses that i have but also this feeling of never quite fitting mm-hmm. in yeah so yeah i remember uh we were you know we were like the pop, they were like the style of music that we liked. Yeah, were people pop. were in sections, they're almost little groups or cliques right. based on their musical preferences. And I remember who, I won't name the name, but um, you know, they were like, oh, they scoffed. Oh, your, your, your musical tastes are so soft. And I thought that was the biggest insult. And now I'm thinking, <laughs> who cares? That's the thing. I mean, the thing is, you're, you're, you know, you're young. Yeah. You're, you know, and you're 19, whatever. You're still trying to formulate right. an identity and you just want to glom onto whatever. Right. So no, I wasn't going to become a, 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 a a punk rocker or, or anything, but I really resisted. I was like, I need to be, I think I went through a mild goth phase. I tried to like speed metal. I can't stand speed metal. You know, mm-hmm. I think I remember one time I played Public Enemy, My Uzi Weighs a Ton, mm-hmm. and my friend Chuck, he was like, yeah, you sound so not of that, you know, like somebody <laughs> that should be saying it. You're like, yes, that is uh, My Uzi Weighs a Ton by Public Enemy. I'm like, I was not. I was a little hipper than that. But um, yeah, well, and then going back to what you're saying is yeah. I, my, I was encouraged to, to be 
I don't know if stoic or keeping up a stiff upper lip because mm. Middle East, Arabs are not really known for keeping a stiff upper lip, but right. it was all, you know, just don't let it bother you. Let mm-hmm. it, oh, just ignore it. My mother would always say, oh, just, you know, she would always say, Turkey, which is just leave it, you know, just mm. you're better than that. You're be above it. And so I was always above it. Right. And then I'd add this layer of, of I'm going to make fun of myself so nobody else could. And I couldn't, I felt like I didn't connect with people mm-hmm. because of that. It took me a long time to find people to connect with. I mean, I don't know. I'm yeah, actually pretty much I think you and I, you know, we've been we've had our ups and downs and sure. you know, but it was you, we had I remember when like maybe 10 years later after we'd been here, no, it was it was in 2000. Anyway, it doesn't matter, but the point is that you and I had this conversation which and it was my first fight because I'd never had a fight with anyone because I didn't mm. I was so conflict averse mm. because I was so desperate to fit in. I just wanted to be a chameleon. And um, so, yeah, you weren't going to see that. Uh, I mean, that, that's nice to know that you thought I wasn't, you didn't see the insecurities because I felt it there. I mean, it was, yeah. I led with it. It was just like, yeah. I'm insecure. But I think it's also being young. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, the other thing that's interesting about the book is that you talk about, you know, other people feeling it the wrong end of the table. And, it, and it, you know, I think everybody in a certain sense has that, you know, mm-hmm. whether they want to openly talk about it or not. Uh, there's always a time that somebody just feels like they, you know, like I, I joke to people when I go to parties, I'm the punch bowl guy, you know, cause it, it, it's hard to feel comfortable for just about anybody really. Yeah. I mean, you know, unless they're my kid, you know, right. my kid fits in anywhere, but, um, he does. You know, I don't want to get on it, but no, that's it's, awesome. it's one of those things where he doesn't understand when people don't want to talk to him. Right. You know? well, so. I think that's also a product of this generation and, yeah. and the path, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, um, do you feel, I mean, as, as a Muslim American, I mean, when did you get your citizenship? Just out of curiosity. Uh, I was 12. Wait mm. a minute. I don't want to get too specific because what if this winds up in the wrong hands? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no, it's funny because I was, there was, I was filling out something and now they have, I don't know if they always did, but now they mm. have a separate form that says, are you a naturalized citizen? Mm. They never used to have that, yeah. which is a little scary. So luckily yeah. I didn't, I, it was the wrong form and I didn't fill it out, but um so when my I when I was I think I was eleven and my parents were naturalized. Okay. So I automatically became I see. that. My sister was born here, so she's the only one that can run for president. So you, so you can't um, uh, you president. can't you can't run for president. Uh, uh, do you feel that? Um, see, I we did uh, my Do, who is uh, Vietnamese, mm-hmm. and uh, she she's uh, uh, full disclosure she does the, she's the editor in chief of the Proclaimer our news site. Uh-huh. Um, but she talked, one of the things that surprised me was that she talked about a lot of racism and bigotry based on uh, being Vietnamese. Right. Which, again, I don't, again, maybe it's my own naive to A, but uh, a naiveness, but, uh, it, but uh, I, you know, I, I didn't think that necessarily an Asian American would be subjected to the kind of racism that, say, an African American might or right. a Latino might. Do you find, and again, like when I met you, I didn't think anything about the mm. fact that you were Muslim right. or, or Iraqi or anything like that. Right. To me, it was more interesting than anything else. But do you find or do you, did you feel that there was a certain kind of uh, bigotry towards you or, or because of your heritage and, and, uh, and ethnicity? Well, it's interesting because, and I talk about this in the book, this, this you know period where I felt like I was the outsider and suddenly I felt like, I was an outsider, but talking to another outsider. Mm-hmm. It was a, a, a whole conversation I had with an African American friend of or cousin of um, my roommate, mm-hmm. and um, it was the first time I felt like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be the outsider, but here I have this privilege of presenting as a white person, mm-hmm. and it's an interesting thing. And you know, you're you're familiar with the whole concept of well, I, I won't go too much into it, but intersectionality. Which is basically, I, I, it, I just, you know, there's a definition that I haven't memorized, but to me, it's, I talk about it in the book, it's about how everybody's experience mm-hmm. is unique to them. And that's the, the, the concept that really changed my life. Um, and I only discovered it the, uh, in 2000, was it seven? When was the first Women's March? Uh, two years ago. Yeah. So w- that time, because, you know, it was suddenly everybody was upset about, you know, that, that, you know, suddenly like the whole, the, the way it turned out was that, or the way it, it came up was that a lot of Caucasian women mm-hmm. were, uh, you know, in, in this walking in the, in the, in the March. And then a lot of my friends who mm-hmm. were immigrants like me mm-hmm. were like, 
no, we don't want, you know, we, we don't feel it. Like, what is this? We've been, and then a lot of my African American friends were, you know, saying, well, they weren't at Black Lives Matter. Suddenly now they're uh, targeted, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they're targeted and they're upset, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, it, so trying to not make this go off on a tangent that maybe we don't want to go to, but uh, my answer to that is that, yeah, I, I, it's an interesting thing that I, I felt like I didn't get, discriminated against or before the war before mm -hmm. the iraq before war. the first because, iraq war right and because there was nothing there was mm -hmm. no um there was no connection mm -hmm. with most people didn't even know where iraq was. right and so i think it, actually some people still don't know where iraq is pretty much yeah i yeah. mean that's i didn't want to i don't want to uh, overstate that but yeah i mean it, you know I, I joke in the book that you know and when I came to, we, we, we came to Ohio and then went to Kentucky and then people, you know, would ask me where I was from and I, nobody knew where Iraq was. So I'd say I was from Ohio and they're like, mm, <laughs> I don't know. Like they, at least, you know, they had, yeah. they were savvy enough to know you look like you're from Columbus. No, but, but Cleveland, um, Cleveland, maybe. Cleveland. I, yeah, well, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I've never, but that would be lying and I'm not yeah. a liar. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I desperately wished I was from Italy or something, mm -hmm. you know, and I even tried to make the case, you know, like we talk with our hands. But uh, <laughs> and again, I'm getting off of your point, your question, which is, it, yeah, I did not feel discriminated against because it was easy for me mm -hmm. to pass. And I desperately wanted to pass. What's yeah. your name? Like, oh, you know, what kind of name is that? That mm -hmm. kind of, that was the most I would get. Mm -hmm. I think in Ohio one time we were at a, a skating rink and um, some a kid asked his dad. We were my parents were talking Arabic and he asked his dad what what um, what are they? And he goes, I don't know. They're probably Mexican or something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that's what you they knew. Right. So it was that, and then the Gulf War happened, and then suddenly it became us against them, where mm -hmm. I was the. I'm the us, I'm mm -hmm. American, mm -hmm. and you know my brother could have easily mm -hmm. been uh, called to you know fight. to fight, yeah. and it was this really bizarre realm when I was in journalism class and all the at the time the students were saying you know the, one one woman had a fiance there and we should just bomb them all you know mm -hmm. it was this really weird realm so that yeah. was the first time that I've really experienced it or after nine eleven um, after nine eleven it, it was it was hard because it was this thing where I was surprised that not more people, not more people from the Muslim community were coming out and speaking out against it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, looking back, I know it was just, it was, it's a complicated time. And, yeah. you know, every... Well, I mean, why don't you think they were coming out to speak? I think a lot of it was fear. I think mm -hmm. a lot of it is we want to, we want to say the right thing. And mm -hmm. at, at, at the time, and I don't, I hope I don't, I'm not speaking out of turn because I'm only speaking about my experience and people that I've spoken mm -hmm. to. See, the thing is with the, one of the things about be, uh, my religion is that it's not a monolithic religion. In other words, I look at me, I'm, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm not, I don't have, I don't cover my hair. Mm -hmm. I, I don't present visibly Muslim. Mm -hmm. And my beliefs are largely spiritual, yeah. and I, I, you know, I believe in the core, believe in the core tenets, which is, you mm -hmm. know, that there's one God and that the Muhammad is his prophet. Right. Everything else are pillars, you know, like mm -hmm. praying and all that. And I'm, I, I, listen, we, we're not here to talk about my my practices, but the point is, it's like that's all that is required mm -hmm. to call yourself a Muslim. But within the culture, it's still a nascent religion, you know, it's still mm -hmm. new, and so a lot of people, and especially from, you know, I grew, I lived in Saudi Arabia. It's that well, how good of a Muslim are you? Right. And so I dealt with that. So that was yeah. dealing with that in my own community. And then also coming out in the, um, you know, the Western community, the, the, the Christian Judeo Christian community. Mm -hmm. you know, it's funny. I mean, it's it, that, that there's even that kind of judgment of, uh, how good a, a Muslim are you? I, Cause yeah. I, my wife deals with how good a Jew you are, right. you know, it's, and, it's, and I, I, I constantly deal with how good a Catholic am I, right. which, you know, according to my mom, not very good. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's universal. Yeah, but, yeah. but it's, you know, these are the, when you're dealing with it, and it's so loud and you're trying to reconcile that you don't connect that there's other cultures going through it mm -hmm. because you're, all you're seeing is you're going to go to hell if you don't da 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 da. And, um, you know, it took me years to find my, my uh, relationship with my religion in, in a way that's spiritual mm -hmm. and fulfilling yeah. and still connects with how, the, how did you do that i mean what was it that um... a lot of self-analysis a lot you know just mm -hmm. you know a lot of actually what i did was i stopped talking to people of the faith mm -hmm. it was it, i talked to people who were atheists strangely mm -hmm. who under who had read about all the religions yeah because they didn't have an emotional response mm -hmm. i think the fact that my parents were not uh they didn't push it on me they just yeah. said eh, you know you should do this, this, and this. They took us to Saudi Arabia when I was uh, 
when we were nine, I lived there for five years. We lived there for five years to learn the culture. Mm -hmm. And that was the extreme. I mean, you know, it's, it's Saudi Arabia. It was Saudi Arabia before all of this stuff, but it was still Saudi Arabia. You know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very, it's a religious country. It's Mm -hmm. the women cover, you know, all of that cover their hair and their face. Um, but I just, yeah, I just really, um, I really just, you know, went through the, just the, I mean, listen, I'm not in my twenties anymore. So I spent all these years just, you know, the process, you know, that you go through. Um, and then I think what happened was around after nine 11, then people were starting to talk Mm -hmm. finally. And I, I became connected with the group Muslim Public Affairs Council, MPAC. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my women friends there, I mean, a couple of them were hijabi women. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, I, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I do com, I write comedy, but I don't want to offend anybody Mm because I don't, you know, I was thinking Salman Rushdie and the Fetwa and all that stuff. (laughs) And then actually there's a chapter in the book about that. But, um, they said to me, they said the best thing. They said, just no, you've got to speak your truth, speak, be authentic. Mm-hmm. And just who cares if you insult people? I'm like, yeah, my life is not, your life's not on the line. <laughs> but you know, I think I'm not doing it in any sort of, you know, offensive way. I'm just saying this is me. Mm-hmm. It's not, I think the biggest thing is, is realizing and realizing that we're not all the same. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I was on a panel, um, I also talk about this in the book. I was on a panel where they asked me uh, to speak about being Muslim in Hollywood and I First, first I was proud, and then mm. the next minute I kind of flipped out because I thought, "What do I have to say?" You know, mm. I'm look at me again. Like I'm not a you know I can go in and get a job and pretend I'm not Muslim. That's cheating, mm. right? But it's not because there's so many people like me, and I think that was another thing reason why I really felt like I sh- I should write this because I thought, what if there's somebody out there like, like when I was growing up, I didn't have any of that. I didn't have it was either you're, you know, Muslim and you, you know, uh, you wanted to marry the white guy, non-Muslim, whatever, and your parents disowned you, so you just forged your own path and you were Mm -hmm. so, you know, fearless, or you were just doing your thing. And I was neither. I didn't want to, you know, shun my parents, Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to, you know, just fall into this thing that I didn't necessarily, you know, that it wasn't true to me. So... I just had to, I don't know, it just took a while to figure it out. And luckily just talking, you know, whenever I met somebody that Mm -hmm. had a remote, you know, seed of what I might be feeling, talking to them. And that's why right now it's so great, you know, come back to the authenticity thing. There's so many people that are talking about their experiences, varied experiences Mm -hmm. and how, you know, there's, you'll meet different Muslims and, you know, there are Muslims that are covered up and they're like, it's my job to educate you. And then there's Muslims that are like, it's not, none of, you know, I don't have to tell you. Yeah. I personally feel like it's, I like to talk to people. I like to connect. I like to, mm. you know, um, you know, I, I don't like talking to people personally. Well, so I, I, mean, <laughs> well, I like, you know what I like, but it. I love irony, which is why I do the show. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love that. Yes. Yeah. You are good at that. Yeah. No, I, I, and what I mean by that is I like to connect with, find out their stories, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, as much as it sounds like I'm talking, I'm, I, I do clearly like talking, but um, I like, <laughs> but it's that, you know, the whole thing, like I, there's a woman, um, when I wrote this, I thought, okay, this is great. This is my story. So I wrote mm-hmm. it. This is my story. It's cathartic, right? Yeah. Maybe it'll connect with somebody of my generation. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like lately the young, the youth, the youths of today <laughs> are, they have it easier and they, it's just, mm-hmm. they're more open-minded and they don't care, you know, yeah. like the, nobody cares about race and color and all that. But, um, you, you know, Khaki, Khaki from, uh, Khaki, Khaki. one of the founders of, uh, WRFL, right, our from old friend, Kentucky. And she's a, you know, she's a professor at UK and in the journalism department. And she said, I'd love for you to mentor this young lady. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she's kind of a similar ex- background as mine. I think she's Pakistani, she's Muslim. And her parents, um, found out that she had a, a boyfriend and mm-hmm. yanked her out of school. And it was just... You know, I mean, they were saying things that were really radical and just, I didn't expect them, that to be happening in this day and age. And I thought, okay, then I, then something like this is clearly needed for there. It's yeah. not, we're not done yet. Yeah. And, um, anyway. Well, no, I, I think it's, um, I haven't read the whole book, um, but I, I've read enough of it to, to say it's funny. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, it, 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 I found it very revealing about you. Um, <clears throat> The one thing I did notice, though, was uh, in the thank you credits, um, <laughs> there's a name missing. Oh, yeah. Um, what name would that be? Uh, oh, I don't know. Um, 
<laughs> yes, okay, I have gotten grief about this. Um, I was thinking that I was thanking people directly responsible mm. for the book, but yeah. as Steve pointed out that uh, I wouldn't have met my best friend Jude, who's heavily thanked in this, had it not been for my uh, connection with Pilar Alessandra. And I we would, both know, yeah. Right, and uh, who's a script doctor, really popular and yeah. really great. And I wouldn't have met Pilar had it not been for Steve. So therefore, if I'm really doing my due diligence, which I clearly did not, uh, I should have thanked Steve first and foremost. So I'd like to rectify that here <laughs> on the top of Santa Clarita. <laughs> Uh, but that's okay. The next book will be called With Special Thanks to Steve Daniels. And, and that actually shows you how old friends we are because you call me Steve. Nobody calls me Steve anymore. Everybody calls okay. me Steven. So. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Uh, when did that happen? Uh, I don't know. Four or five years ago. Okay. So. Well, so maybe we could have been six-year-old friends. <laughs> we We go back to... 20, yeah, 1980, you said, well, 88, 89, somewhere that. around there. So, so sure. Um, 30 all right. years. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about the book itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought um, it was interesting about like just the titles alone. You, you use a lot of 80s uh, names for the uh, mm -hmm. uh, song titles for, for the book uh, things. Right. And um, you want to tell us why you did that? What was, uh, 
What was the reason behind that? Well, yes, because music is a huge... My life, as I feel like a lot of people's lives, can be measured in chapters mm-hmm. of the musical, you know, uh, pieces of music that they were into. Yeah. Um, for me in high school, I discovered the Beatles in high school for yeah. some reason. I guess like all, I guess I figured all kids discover them in the high school, probably in actual time that they happened. But in high school, I was obsessed and I listened to every single album as mm. if it were real time. And mm. when it got to, what was it? Is it Abbey Road or the White Album where they were about to break up? I was so... At, at, uh, the White Album is where they were ready to kill each other. Okay. And Abbey like, Road was the <laughs> record that they did the final record they did together knowing they were going to break up. Right. Okay. So yeah, I remember listening to that and I was so sad. I'm like, oh my God, they're breaking up. I'm like, one of them's passed away. I mean, come on. But um, yeah, music um, for me is a big, I'm very nostalgic about music. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you know, the Rhinestone Cowboy was a thing growing up (laughs) and um, uh, it it, will early days. And also I think as my mom always said, whenever you're you're sad or something mm-hmm. put on music and so here we are in this strange country mm-hmm. and you know everybody's talking funny to me but they're telling me i because i you know i i i grew up in, or i'm sorry i was born in iraq i came here i didn't speak english mm-hmm. so i learned english here i was i think four i learned i had to go to speech therapy because i couldn't say my r's i'd say oh and that's hard for somebody with a name like Acer. Mm-hmm. Acer. But anyway, but so <laughs> then you come home and you music. I mean, you didn't mm-hmm. have to. You can just listen to the melody if you didn't understand the words, mm-hmm. and you know. Um, and I just you know, so it became that. But I had these periods. I remember I went through this weird Barry Manlow phase when I was nine. I had a crush on Barry Manlow. <laughs> He's taken. <laughs> yes, and uh, yes. Well, I don't know what it was. It was his music. So I was like in the heavy or easy listening and. Um, and then in, you know, I, Olivia Newton-John was just, it just, it was like a comfort thing, mm-hmm. but, um, but yeah, it's a big, I mean, you probably have the same thing. I right? do. With, what's I do. your, what, if you talk about a band, okay. So like when your son was born or when yeah. you, when you, when you, you know, your son was young baby yeah. and you, what were some of the, what's the music? Uh, the one that goes through my mind to this day is, uh, it's still that Cat Stevens song. I think it's father and son or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I just, uh, it, it really resonates with me about being a father mm-hmm. and, uh, and the idea of, uh, my son growing up and things. And, uh, um, so I, I don't know. I don't, I, I just, I, I, in, in a more weird way, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy volume two, <laughs> the movie, yeah. um, you know, because it talks about the difference. Uh, my son's adopted for, yeah. for my audiences don't, that, that, that don't know. Um, I, you know, there's the difference between a father and being a daddy. Mm-hmm. You know, and 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 that movie yeah. talks about that. Yeah. You know, it's that's the theme of the film. It's it's like what's the difference between a father and a daddy? Right. And uh, you know, I like to think of myself as a daddy. That's really so, cool. So, yeah. uh, but let's get back to you. Let's talk about. Um, I, I'm curious about like <coughs> one of the things you do a lot of the footnotes with your mother uh, <laughs> as she read the book uh, and her her opinions and her, her thoughts. Mm. Um, and you, and you, one of the things you talked about is the fact that they were disappointed the fact you went into journalism school as opposed to being a doctor. Um, how have you rectified that with your parents? Have they always been uh, disappointed with you as far as <laughs> things go? <laughs> well, well, no. I mean, I think I start out with that, and then yeah. it, the the book takes a narrative and it, yeah. it comes back around. And I love my mother. My mother's awesome. She's mm. badass, and she's very. She has very opinions. She has very, she has very strong opinions and very specific opinions mm-hmm. about things that sometimes don't make sense. Which um, you know you'll find out when you read the book, but um, I uh, so yeah I I was in I was at UK and this was before Christian Amanpour was mm-hmm. really a thing, and I told them I wanted to be a journalism mm-hmm. a jur- journalist a journalist and mm-hmm. they're like well sure but you have to get a double major because you're not going to you, you have something to fall back on yeah <laughs> something to fall back on and so I because I'm the dutiful oldest kid I thought yeah. oh fine. So I, I think my double major was either, it might have been organic chemistry and then it went to biology or something. Mm-hmm. And I, I think I took, I didn't want, I've never dissected anything in biology class. Mm-hmm. So I think we dissected something and I went, no, I'm out. And then I went, <laughs> okay, let me do organic chemistry. And then I'm like, I can't even. So I finally went to them I'm like, mom, please, I can't do that. Right. Let me just, and at that point, um, you know, it was, this was around the mm-hmm. Gulf, the first Gulf War. Yeah. yeah. So then, um, 
So Christiana Mampour was mm. a thing. And, yeah. you know, they saw her and she's elegant and she's a woman of color, you know. Um, and they thought, okay, great, you're going to be Christiana Mampour. And then I said, okay, cool. And then I thought, no, I don't want to be in front of the camera. So they were disappointed about that. And then I came to, <laughs> to, uh, to I mean, their dis- disappointments are, they're short-lived. But yeah, they yes. were like, oh, well, you should do this. Okay, no, I don't want to do this. Okay, fine. So then I come to film, to you know, out to film school. And they're suddenly, they're like, she, you know, like, I think all kids, their parents do that because a lot yeah. of my friend, my friends that worked at Miramax, their family always told everybody, oh, they run Miramax, you mm-hmm. know, and they're an assistant or something. That's mm-hmm. just a parent thing. Yeah. But um, no, I mean, now they like, my dad quotes me part of, parts of the book and my mom is, you know, like we, this whole thing, we had this yeah. whole dialogue about Thanksgiving. My parents celebrate on Friday instead of yeah. Thursday because, yeah. you know, we can travel and it's cheaper or whatever but um yeah she's like quoting from the book so i feel like they finally mm. have forgiven me <laughs> we'll see we'll see what happens you know but um and i tried to you know i think her the concern in the beginning was don't bring any shame on the family i think at one point she's like can't you just make up a cousin and give her all the stories you know <laughs> Because, you know, it's not, I call it a Muslim girl tell some, because yeah. it's not a tell all. It's not gory. I don't go yeah. into, you know, the gory details about mm. dating and all that nonsense. I shouldn't say nonsense, but you know, but it is nonsense. Um, but yeah, she, um, you know, I think she was, that was the more co- the concern. And But I think I've, I, you know, she seems happy with it so far. So, I mean, I shouldn't say so far. She's read it. She seems happy with it. And we'll see. Well, she can brag that you have a book out. Exactly. You know, so um, you define yourself as the world's worst Arab in it. Why do you say that? <laughs> well, that's a joke. But I, because I'm terrible, I'm not, um, first of all, uh, you know, on the surface, I'm the mm. lightest skin of my all my family. Mm. They, you know, I look not, I think I'm lighter than you, actually. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going for the Donald Trump look, so. Okay, that's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, you know, I don't, uh, I, that's tongue in cheek, but I don't like the, the typical things that Arabs mm-hmm. are, are stereotypical like, like the parties yeah. and, you know, music, you know, that kind of music and Arabic food. I don't like Lebanon. There's this yogurt yeah, drink. Yeah, I was wondering how you pronounce it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's disgusting. It's really good for you. It's like Lassi. You know, um, uh-huh. the Indian drink, it's like a yogurt drink. Yeah. I or don't know. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, there's every culture has a version of it, but I just think yeah. it's disgusting. And now they have this thing called, it's bubbly yogurt, yeah. it's, but it's really good for you because it has a lot of electrolytes. Well, and then it probably tastes terrible. So. I, my dad swears by it. And, you know, a lot of Arabs love it. And I yeah. don't. And, you know, I think I, I like dates and some Arabic food. But yeah, so that was kind of. Um, more sort of to you know talk about the things that we're supposed to like and, yeah um that i'm not good at <laughs> do you pray do you pray the five times a day is a muslim supposed to or you know something that is very judgy is it I, <laughs> I, <laughs> that is very specific do you do you do things that you're supposed to um, no i no, no i don't I, I just, um, but, I, uh, yes i tr- i don't do it as often as i mm-hmm. should do it but that's not an Arabic thing. That's a Muslim thing. Well, okay. Yeah. All right. But I mean, you're Muslim, so I'm, right. I was just wondering. I mean. <clears throat> yes. Well, yes. I that... mean, it, it, to be honest with you, I mean, it's hard, I think, for the dumb white guy that I am to is not associate Arab with Muslim. Even usually. in t- 2019, my friend? On a certain level, yes. I mean, it, okay. you can't help. Well, I think. I think. I, I agree. I Actually, a good friend of mine in school uh, is a uh, Christian Muslim, uh, mm-hmm. Christian Arab. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, which was a surprise to me when I met her. So. Listen, in fairness, I didn't know that either when mm-hmm. I was younger. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, actually, um, I, uh, when I first came here many yeah. years ago, I met a, an Iranian woman and I asked her if she was Muslim because I assumed, and she said, no, I'm Jewish. And I yeah. kind of, so again, it's all, don't call yourself, I wouldn't say dumb. I would just say, just haven't had the exposure yet. And that's what. That's would, the PC way of saying it. I, most, most people would just say you're dumb. Well, okay, have, ignorant is better though. Because ignorant, ignorant. Well, it, you, you, okay. Ignorance. <laughs> well, I don't know. anyway, we're not going to get into semantics here, but we should. No, but um, yeah, it, it's it. It really is. That's the thing. Is is I used to. I joke about that. It, you're being judgmental about the prayer thing. Mm. I'm totally fine with it. I, you know, it's more. I'm very. I have a very spiritual relationship. Mm-hmm. I do the the things. Yeah. Um, I try to do the things as best as I can. Yeah. Sometimes I don't do the things as well as I should. The things like fasting and, mm-hmm. um, you know, praying five times a day. I, I you know, give to charity that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. 
so those are you know they're, they're the five pillars. Do you want right. to, do you want to get into all that? No. Okay. Yeah. We don't need to. <laughs> but um, but so yeah. Before the five pillars, people can find out about right. By you can Google book. it. Yeah. yeah um, Google it. Or Bing it or whatever yeah, the yeah. free you know yeah. like copyright stuff. But um, I, that's the thing. Like I think now what I'm trying to get. I it took me a while to be okay with that to answer that question, mm-hmm. which is not something. I mean, do I? That's a weird. That's a question that I yeah I I didn't yesterday. You know what I mean? Like okay. how about that? That's an answer. No, I, I I say that because you know I just recently saw the big sick and you know one of the big things mm-hmm. about that I'm assuming you've seen it but yeah. you know one of the big things he's Pakistani but right. he's also Muslim sure. and they there's a big emphasis on the moment when he tells his parents that he does not pray five times a day right and they flip out about it right. and and I guess you know having never met your family mm-hmm. um it, it you know i can't help and, and a little bit of what i read in there uh, was you know the idea that your parents have that judgmental kind of quality to it uh, you know just because they expect certain things of you because you're an arab uh, or a muslim okay. right uh you know do you see what i'm going with yes. that so. so let me clarify for you yes um my parents are there it's cultural mm-hmm. it's uh, the culture is more is is a bigger thing than the religion in fact mm. you know it's funny because i talk about in i think in the yeah talk about it in the book but um the idea of being muslim as a it's like being jewish you know yeah. it's it's sewn into your fiber mm-hmm. i have a friend who's an atheist muslim mm-hmm. and you know, I, I know a lot of Muslim friends of mine are like, mm-hmm. that's nonsense because part of being Muslim mm-hmm. is believing in God. And she's like, well, no, I have this, you know, I had some bad experiences in my childhood and I want to see, I want proof. And so there's mm-hmm. no proof. I'm scientific. And so, but it's very much part of my core. I am, you know, I identify yeah. it, it as that. And I think that's the thing is you can, it's, it's more of a philosophical debate. You can mm-hmm. sit there and, but to answer your question, I think my parents never, they would be disappointed in things that I did that would be against the culture, which is sort of yeah. religious. So it's not so much, um, did you pray? It's you shouldn't be out with boys, mm-hmm. you know, cause yeah. that's not, you know, that kind of thing. What are you doing drinking? You know, that kind yeah. of, Oh, come on. You know, mm-hmm. did you, you know that it was that kind of stuff. Yeah. It was more of the extreme, the extremer. Is that a word? The more extreme, <laughs> the extremer stuff. Yeah. The extremer um, stuff. Okay. But yeah. So, but again, getting back to that, the mm-hmm. big sick, that is a, that is one family that's uh, based experience. on a, being Pakistani more than being well, Muslim. Well, I can't even. I don't even want to. Yeah. Sure, but I, I don't mean, even. Okay. I don't even want to be that specific because yeah. I know a lot of Pakistani families that mm. are not like that. Okay. So I think that's the thing is that it's not a monolithic religion. Mm. Not it doesn't fit into a box. Sure. And that's going to take some time. But mm. I think that the dialogue and that's the thing. Like I hope I would encourage you and your listeners to just reach out and talk to people because yeah. it's not a dumb, I mean, when you say dumb, that's why I say don't, it's not dumb. It's just, you haven't, if you don't, if you have one exposure to something, sure. listen, this is going to show me as a complete idiot. But, um, when I came to Lexington Catholic, when I was, um, however old, whatever I went as a, we came from Saudi Arabia, I went to Catholic school. Mm. I didn't know Easter was a religious holiday that my parents <laughs> never, we thought just the Easter bunny. I don't know. We never yeah. talked about religion in that right. regard. We yeah. didn't, you know, my parents probably had a hard enough time telling me of my own religion. So they didn't explain, you know, mm. so that's what I'm saying. Like you don't have, and I, you know, my first day of Catholic school, I went and took the sacrament because I didn't know what it was all about. And I was freaking <laughs> Ooh, out. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I, yeah, I apologize for any, you know, Catholics. I didn't know. I was like in the line. I didn't want to get out of the line. It <laughs> you was, just wanted to join in and, and be part of it. So I just, no, I was like, if I, if I stay back, it's going to look bad. But mm-hmm. if I do it, you know, and I think when the guy <laughs> said, open your, uh, the guy, I'm sorry, the priest, <laughs> <laughs> when the um when we got up to the front and he yeah. you know placed the the body you know but yeah. i think i held my i went i said something like ah like i'm at the doctor or something <laughs> it was i'm not proud um but again like you have to be able to affor- that's what i'm saying the intersectionality you have to be able to forgive mm-hmm. yourself or say well how you know you didn't look you didn't know this then but now right. you know now so right. okay what are we going to do about it now yeah and so I would just, you know, not to, this is my PSA portion, but don't call yourself dumb. So okay. Unenlightened. How about that? Or uninformed. Uninformed. That's the best, okay. uh, yeah, or a the, better way of, you know. Sure. Okay. But that's what we're doing here. Oh yeah. We're, we're in working life. to inform. I, I, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is because I do think that, um, particularly Santa Clarita, the Santa Clarita Valley, there is a certain, I mean, there's a lot of conservatives out in this area mm-hmm. and I think there's a certain kind of, um, well, uninformed 
populace to Muslims in general. Uh, really? Uh, uh, here? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, I remember in 2014, there was a, a guy who was Muslim who ran for city council, and at, at a forum, a woman stood up, stood up because he was talking about wanting to have a cultural center. Mm-hmm. And she said, I, we don't want this kind here. Right. You know, um, and again, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that I just, for me, I don't think about it too much. It's like, you just go to someplace different to pray. You know, I mean, it's not that, you know, I, Bono, you know, it's like, they're all sons of Arab, you know, uh, uh, you know, all our prophets are sons of Arab, uh, of Abraham, excuse right. me, Arab, sons of Abraham. Um, so, I mean, it's not, but, but I thought it'd be interesting to have you on because to talk about a little bit about, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, do you, have you, what, what has been the. I, I, let's talk about Trump's America a little bit. I mean, <laughs> I mean, because you you talked about uh, uh, it, you know it starts with Trump and ends with Oprah is one of your uh, one of the things that uh, your publicist sent me here. And uh, you want to tell me about what that means exactly? Or um, well, that was referring to I had written a piece a while ago where uh, it's I modified it for the book. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically, my uh, good friend of mine, well, my best friend, one of my best friends, she's a, her cha- her name has changed for the book, but. Um, we had a conversation about um, that I how I felt like Trump was a catalyst for change, mm-hmm. and I think I think the word I used maybe was not even I think we settled on catalyst for change, but it was I think I said something like game changer or something like that, yeah. and she and she's a very she's a liberal and she got very upset you know uh, understandably so because I'm sitting here thinking why is what are you saying? Like this guy's a destruction, you know, he's mm-hmm. in destroying things. And, um, and so the Oprah part was that, you know, that was her speech. It refers to her speech at the golden globes last mm-hmm. year yeah. where she, you know, kind of, you know, she came out and spoke about this is now is our time. And mm-hmm. I mean, anytime Oprah, Oprah says anything, she's amazing. You just want to sure. you know, hug her. I like when she says you get a car. So anyway, go ahead. <laughs> she doesn't say that anymore. Yeah, that was no. her birthday, by the yeah, way, yesterday. But anyway, yeah. um, so that, it starts with, so it was this, this whole Trump thing. That yeah. It was this kind of charted my, uh, this aspect of our, part of my friendship with, with this person. And then uh, how we f- had a falling out about Trump. And then we were it kind of, Oprah unified us because we both got on the phone. You know, it's just, you know how friends are. They fight yeah. about but stuff. I mean, were you, are, were you a supporter? Are you a supporter of Trump? I am not a supporter of Trump. Okay, so let me clarify. No, mm. I am not a supporter of Trump. Um, basically, I think that because what, so I talk about this in the book, the, that he, because he, that he's been so vocal mm-hmm. about everything. Yeah. It's caused other people to, you know, the people on my side, the people on the left side mm-hmm. to stand up and, and, you know, talk and, and try to make their voices heard loud. Yeah. And that's what I mean is that it's, you know, a, a couple of friends of mine, um, said that when Obama was president, we just sat back and we mm. just, you know, we thought everything was going to be great because it was being handled in Washington, Yeah, but it's not being handled in Washington now yeah. for a big well i would say most of us mm-hmm. you know um again i only i try to speak not i try to speak about me and my mm-hmm. experiences and not try to general, generalize but i think in this case we can both agree right yeah no well, I, so my, I, my audience knows i'm no fan of trump so. okay fine no i'm i am not a supporter of trump i um never was i think that there but i think that it, it well it's an interesting thing because i'm from iraq and that's fascism and i yeah. when i we when he first you know, mm-hmm. got elected, and his couple of first couple of press. Uh, who was his first one? Uh, Sp- Sean Spicer, where mm-hmm. he got up there, and it was all this rhetoric. And I thought, this is like Iraq. Yeah, it's just you know. So um, it, it it just kind of got me thinking because again, I'm coming from that point of view of like, I've been through this, but yeah. yet we're here in a democracy, right. and we shouldn't. This shouldn't be happening in America, mm-hmm. but it's happening. So what are we going to do about it? Mm-hmm. There's nothing. I mean, we can sit here and wait for four years. And I went through this whole phase. I remember the, the night of the election feeling, and I and I, I didn't tell anybody this because I felt like it was a, it was really disrespectful to 9-11, but I felt like this is worse than 9-11. I really did. I felt scared in a way mm-hmm. because I thought, great, now all these quote unquote racists, whatever, are going to come out of the woodwork and yeah. any of this, you know, um, discrimination that I experienced on a very small level after yeah. 9-11 is going to be 
bigger. Right. And I, you know, I don't even know who these people are and blah, mm. blah, blah. And um, so I was scared. And then I, when I started talking to people in my circle about it, they said, oh yeah, we felt the same way. So I, you know, again, I felt like, because every, every thought I have, I think this is really radical. This is, I shouldn't share this. It's just me that feels it. And then I share it and somebody else feels it. And I was so going to say, there's the, the, that moment where everybody discovered they're at the wrong side of the table. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, so yeah, no, to get back to your thing, I'm not a supporter of Trump. I just think that because what he's doing, what's happening right yeah. now in Washington, it's offering an opportunity for what well, has already a lot. I mean, donations that first year in, mm. in November were at the, an all time high charity. Sure. Um, when the Muslim ban and the, and the, I mean, did you, you watch the videos of in the airports the mm. first time where mm. the, you know, these lawyers were sitting on the floor on their weekend yeah. working pro bono to get people. And that was amazing to me. And that's I, what I felt like that was America. Are you, I mean, and I guess what you're saying is that, um, because Trump is so radical, that there's going to be a, a radical pushback from the left? Is that, is that what you see happening? Not, you know what? Yes, the left, but also just f humanity. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, um, just this is not right. We don't, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not going to sit back and, and, and feel marginalized. I'm going to say something yeah. about it. It's my, it's basically the people. The power mm -hmm. is in the people. Right. Instead of thinking, you know, and I'm not speaking as a politician or anything. I'm just speaking about my, mm -hmm. from my experience personally. Right. And my immediate friend, my circle who are, from different, you know, I have a, a, a friend who's Nigerian, Filipino. I have a friend who's black, you know, Afri Af African American. I have a friend who's um, Iranian uh, mm -hmm. American. I have a friend who's Iranian. I have a friend who's Pakistani American. They all are different, you know, I have a friend who's liberal, you know, to the extreme left and then more centrist, but they all have this idea of like, we got to do something mm -hmm. here. We got to yeah. do something. Let's stand up, yeah. you know, speak out. If, you know, um, all of that and, and all that happened with the Me Too movement and the mm -hmm. Time's Up and all that, it's just, it's in the zeitgeist now yeah. and, I, and it's a chicken and egg, which came first. But yeah. I feel like he is, in a way, if you look at it, that was this moment where we mm -hmm. thought everything's great. Well, at least, right. I shouldn't say we, not all of us we, but maybe us in like on the left, on the coasts, right? Mm -hmm. We all felt like, oh, everything's great, Obama, everything. You know, every, we sh let's not see color, we're gonna be politically correct, all right. of this. And now suddenly people are, you know, saying, what are you, da, 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 again. And just, I mean, horrible things are happening every single day. Like, it just, I just read about something horrible that happened in Chicago yesterday. Yeah. I mean, it just, you know, so I, all we have is our own voices. And it's, we're in this weird, we're in like a revolution right now. So, yeah, so Trump is a catalyst for change or, yeah. or that, whatever, that, that dogma, Things. you know. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whatever yeah. the phrase is, but... um does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. You're like, and then some. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I just didn't like the part about my Trump supporter. No, I no, no, no. I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> okay. uh, so, you know, um, and, and I'm just, um, do you, we're going to wrap up here, but I'll just ask you a real a couple of quick questions. Do you find, is it easier to be a Muslim American, say, on the coast? You talk about the coast versus, say, living in Kentucky. Um, uh, um, I can't speak to that now because i haven't been back to kentucky mm -hmm. um i'm going to go you know when, when the book well, i mean but growing up i mean uh, did you find that it was easier to be out in this of area, course you know yeah, yeah yeah oh my god are you kidding me yeah i mean when i when i drove on to uh, the 10 freeway to get to here for school i felt like mm -hmm. that's it i fit in i mean this is it i'm like driving traffic i don't care i love it here yeah and you can never convince me otherwise because it's the first time i felt like i connected mm -hmm. it's the first time i felt like i fit in i don't have to be somebody i'm not yeah you know there's other people i'm my name is not the weirdest name it's actually the most normal name there's some you know crazy yeah. names yeah like steven um, like steven exactly yeah, yes. yeah it's i think i mean obviously it is because of well by I'm grossly generalizing, but it is bec for me, or because there's a bigger population of Muslims here than mm -hmm. I think that there are in Kentucky at the moment. I mean, yeah. you've been back yeah. recently, yeah? Yeah. So anytime you have a group where there's a bigger community, <laughs> um, you're going to have people mm -hmm. that are more open about it. Sure. I don't know that there's, is there, is there a mosque? There's a, actually, uh, in my hometown of Frankfurt, there is actually a mosque um, down the street from where I live or from where my mom, where my mom lives. And, I, and I, I'll tell you exactly what, after 9-11, when I noticed it uh, the first time, mm -hmm. uh, I, I made the remark uh, to a friend of mine, a member of my family actually, and uh, said, there's a mosque over there. Look at that. I didn't mm -hmm. know that. And they went, yes, I know. 
you know so i mean there's that kind of uninformed right you know about about you know because i i think the fear and the generalizations and the stereotypes and things like that and right. i think your book does a great job of um breaking that stereotype well, so. I hope so um what's next for you what what, what, what after now the book's going to be when does the book come out officially march 5th march 5th yep. okay so this this will be up about two weeks before okay. hand and uh awesome. it'll be available on amazon i assume on kindle and uh, it other, is on amazon uh, i also did i have a i recorded an audio book um, nice which was super fun yeah uh, and also crazy to just relive your life in three days you yeah. know, it's a different thing when you're reading it yeah. and saying it um, what's next and I'm gonna do some appearances around town I'm gonna go back home to Kentucky which I'm really nice. super excited about the um, couple of spots khakis setting up nice um, and um, and then yeah maybe work on the, the next one is there a sequel you know I mean, the other side of the table. The other, the right side of the, the table. The right side of the table. Yes. <laughs> no, the sequel is going to be called um, "With Thanks to Steve." <laughs> As without it should whom be. Whom I wouldn't be where I am. I'd buy that book. And um, we'll see how. Yeah, I, I'm working on that now. Um, <laughs> do you think, rem- do you remember just just on a quick side note? Do you remember what the Red Hot Chili Pepper said? To you at the radio station. You want me to re? Yes. Yes, I want to recant because really? I I think this is hysterical. Okay, uh, for a full disc. Yes. Yeah, so so here's the story. I was this again trying to fit in. Yeah. I wore baggy t-shirts. I hadn't discovered. I don't know how specific you want me to get, but I hadn't discovered padded bras yet. Yeah. So I didn't have the. And this is this is important because of what they said. I didn't <laughs> have like a. I wasn't endowed in the top as they were. I didn't have cleavage, whatever. I was wearing a t-shirt that was a crew neck. I think it was bloused and mm. into some jeans. I was on the radio. I was. It was my show. I was 19. I was you know so like naive and everything. They come on, um, there were guests, and the, um, who was the... Jack Smith, Jack I Smith think, was yeah. doing the interview. Was he... It's okay, so... I think he, he told me he threw you out so he could do the interview. Probably, <laughs> yeah, because I think, yeah, he was like, yeah, he, yeah, that's this, what it was. Now, this is, just <laughs> for our audience sake, this is the Red Hot Chili Peppers in 1989, so they're still on the fringe <laughs> music tastes and, and, and anything but PC, known for wearing their socks on their genitals. Right. So, uh, and, and uh, that, that, that's the backstory. They came into the radio station, WRF, the right. college radio station probably the biggest band at the time mm-hmm. to, to come into the radio station right. and and i happened to have the luck or whatever you know dubious luck i was it, it, i had a prime time slot at the time yeah. at, and it was monday at between two to five two to five I and remember. so they came in and the and jack who was what the program manager or something yeah. but anyway he came in and obviously rightfully so determined that i wasn't ready to do this interview mm. on my own so he said you know play you know whatever I don't know, beat it or probably more (laughs) polite way of saying it. But before, so as I was, I was collecting my things to step aside, they go, they go live. And he, I think the first thing they, he said was, they said, Oh, can I say penis on the air? And he, and I I forget which one it was a flea. It might've been a flea. flea, Can I say penis on the air? And Jack said, sure. And so every other word was penis, penis, (laughs) penis. And then I think it was Anthony Anthony. who said, we're here with Acer who has these incredibly great knockers. And I'm like, okay, (laughs) the irony, that's what I'm saying. The irony of that was I was wearing this like baggy t-shirt, but okay, fine. (laughs) And so I was like, "Eh, okay. And I didn't say anything. And I walked out and one of the, one of my friends, at the time very outspoken person um gate harangued me how could you let him say that to you you should have stood up for yourself and why didn't you say anything back and he just completely you know anti-feminist and da 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 and you should be i mean i don't think she was as mean as that but it was yeah. just like more like i was like oh my god I, this is horrible yeah what am i doing i'm so not you know i'm not a feminist but you, but you know in a way uh and I've said this about uh, a friend of mine who who wants to experience meeting and kiss, and and they said some incredibly sexist things to her. And I, and in a certain sense, wouldn't you say that if Anthony Kiedis hadn't said something like that, wouldn't you have been kind of disappointed? Just, <laughs> you know what? I, <laughs> it's just what you expect from. <laughs> no, I cannot. In this listen, in this Me Too era, I cannot. I'm no. First of all, no. Because, this well, is thirty years ago, so I mean, you know. I mean, listen. Okay. No, you know what? I'm, I'm going to get myself in trouble. When I was 19, no, yeah. I was deathly afraid of any male anything, yeah. you know. So, um, no, I was so shy and awkward. And I think, 
you know, maybe not, yeah, if he had commented on my hair or something or said right. it's pretty, but not like as specific. So I was just like, uh, but I think it was more, I, I beat myself up like, why didn't I, why would, I wish I was cool enough to say something to shut it down. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it wouldn't have changed, you know, he's probably used to that, but yeah. Yeah, so thank you for bringing up that memory now. <laughs> I'm going straight from here to my shrink. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. And the other memory I have is uh, <laughs> uh, uh, listening to your show uh, before I met you and uh, uh, introducing me to the My Lim- Lemon oh Drops my Inside Out. Yep. Uh, tr- I play track. that every week. Yeah. I ended the show or something. Yeah. Oh, I always remember you playing that. So, uh, quick question Do you have any tattoos? Or is that. Um, no, I want to get one. It's What would it be? Uh, well, I want to get an octopus right here on my wrist. Why an octopus? Because to me, the octopus is the smartest mm-hmm. creature. Well, not to me. To, it, it is the smartest creature. And it's also, um, it kind of, this is going to sound really bad, but just the octopus doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> he doesn't give, he, you know, he just does his thing. Like, have you seen those ones where, those videos, uh, YouTube, where they put the octopus in the jar and they screw yeah, him in sure. there and then he just unscrews it and yeah, he just yeah, sits yeah. there. He's like, I'm not coming out. <laughs> so I think it was more, when I was go, when I was trying to find my authenticity, yeah. it was more that I wanted a symbol of that, like yeah. be the octopus kind of thing. Yeah. Um, is it, do you mention it because I talk about it in the book? No, I, I wanted I, it's to get a standard a tattoo. question on the show. Oh, okay. Oh, because so. I, well, I want, oh, now, now you've, now you know this, so that's a spoiler alert now. I should have just said you'll read about it in the book because there is a chapter in the book where I had a whole spirited discussion with my family about I wanted to get some Arabic writing and they thought it would be a um, security risk at the airport <laughs> to do that. <laughs> so. uh, and then the last thing is we always uh, close out with a joke. Do you have a joke for us? <sighs> Rabbi, a priest, and an imam went to a bar. I don't okay. know. Um, <laughs> God. No, you you have to have okay, a joke okay, for me because okay, I I, 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 I right, gave you plenty is, of warning. This is my dad corny joke. Okay. Um, a mushroom walks into the bar and says, "Hey, I'll have a beer." And the bartender says, "We don't serve your kind here." And the mushroom says, "Why not? I'm a fun guy." <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say it had to be a good. No, joke. that's I I love it. I, I love stupid <laughs> jokes. That's, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. So um, uh, okay, so the book is called "The Wrong End of the Table: A Mostly Comic Memoir of a Muslim Arab American Woman Just Trying to Fit In" by Acer Salman, an old friend of mine who forgot to thank me in the book. The, that's, so, this is the, the prequel to the next book. Uh, well, I'm going to hold you to that. So <laughs> we'll have you back when uh, when that happens. So <laughs> Acer, thanks, uh, thank thanks for doing this. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. So, And uh, we hope you guys enjoyed the talk. You've been listening to the Talk of Santa Clarita. Listen to us on iTunes, SoundCloud.com, YouTube, and Stitcher. Barring a life event getting in the way, a new podcast is available every Tuesday. Questions, comments, and show ideas can be sent to the Talk of Santa Clarita at gmail.com. You can also call or text us at 661-505-8672. That's 661-505-8672. Follow us on Twitter at The Talk of SC or on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at The Talk of Santa Clarita. You can also visit our website by going to www.thetalkofsantaclarita.com. This has been a production of Radio Free Santa Clarita Incorporated, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To donate, go to radiofreesantaclarita.org slash donate. Radio Free Santa Clarita, on the net and on the air, and we're very much aware. Any questions?